hello Lisa here welcome back to my channel and welcome to this deep dive video I'm really excited to be diving into this particular deck it's one that I mentioned quite some time ago that I wanted to do a deep dive on and recently a subscriber reached out and specifically requested that I get to this one sooner or later so I was like you know what let's put it on the sooner docket I've been wanting to do this one like I said for a really long time we are going to be talking about the Ellis deck now I believe I first heard about this tarot deck from Tracy whose channel I believe at the time was called uh, temperance tarot or becoming temperance um and it's a really unique deck that doesn't get a ton of airtime, at least as far as I can see on like the YouTube world. But I actually picked up the fifth edition. And I believe I picked this deck up in 2019. It might have been even before that. Now, there have been, I believe, other editions since. So certain things like cardstock and box, all those kinds of things might be different. But as far as I understand it, the artwork is the same. So I know there's been slightly larger versions. There's been versions with borders, without borders. I think one of the more recent editions actually had like a plasticky cardstock. Um, but we're going to dive into this fifth edition. Mostly I'm going to be talking about the artwork and my personal impressions after working with this deck for a bit of that artwork and the things that jump out at me from that artwork. So we're just going to kind of do this kind of almost like my first impressions walkthroughs. I'm just going to be giving myself permission to take a little bit more time as we hover over the details of the cards. So when I got this deck, it came in this really nice two-piece box. It doesn't have like the thumb cutouts, but it also the box doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So it's pretty easy to open up. And this is actually one of my favorite features about this deck. And one of the things that I think actually makes this deck really approachable for beginners, despite the fact that the imagery does do its own thing, it is very Rider Waite Smith based in my personal opinion. Although maybe those of you who work with other systems might see other systems in these cards as well. Um, Rider Waite Smith system is my home system. What I love about this is this is very distilled down. It's basically like a little chart. And it breaks up essentially the major arcana, the first half of the major arcana as the physical world, the second half of the major arcana as the metaphysical world. So we go from the fool through justice and that's sort of the physical reality. And then the metaphysical reality or metaphysical world is from the hanged man through to the world. This is really great. And for every card, there's just a handful of keywords and that's it. It's kept very distilled down. So it's not overwhelming if you're trying to learn the tarot. Now this I actually think is really cool and other than minor beef with the color associations, I really, really enjoy this. So this, when you open it up on the other side, is basically, uh, it's a chart. <laughs> and I, I actually really like this because it gives you just a single keyword or two for every single card, which you can just look at. Or you can also look at it more numerological and chart style. So for example, I'm just gonna, I, I got my trusty old, um, chopstick here. Um, so down this column here, you have uh, numbers ace through king and keywords for each of those. And then across the top for each suit, you have its element as well as a couple of keywords for it. So for example, in cups, you have water, emotion, uh, relations and health. For rods, which are the wands in this suit, you have fire, intuition, spiritual and creative. For pentacles, you have earth and uh, oh, I can't read that from here. Material. And for swords, you have air, mental, logic, and conflict. Then down this column, you have uh, numerological keywords. So aces for sparks and beginnings, twos for attract, dualism, and balancing. Three here has foundation and creation. Four for rest and stillness. I think it's important to note that these numerological associations may or may not agree with your own personal understanding. For example, I would put foundation in number four, but I would keep creation in number three. That's my own personal um, association with that numbers, those numbers, but it's it still gives you keywords for the numbers and for each of the court cards. For example, this has the queens as nurture and creation, the pages as youth, study, and novice. The knights, uh, I'm just out of the brain there. The knights are crusader and action or motion, and the kings are discipline and stability. But if you know charts, what's really great is you can go, okay, I want water, so emotions, relations, and health, and I want a nine, which is completion and mastery, and we have joy for the nine of cups. So it to me, this is an incredibly smart and logical system 
that I just think would be really great for somebody newer to tarot to use to kind of just get to know basics about the cards without going too deep or going too crazy. I mean, I know I'm telling you that as I'm about to do a deep dive, but I love geeking out on the imagery, but something like this just feels so much less overwhelming if you're trying to learn, in my opinion. But again, we all learn differently, so this may or may not work for, for you or for somebody you know, but I just, I love this. And I've talked about this before, but I just think it's really, really, really cool. So let's talk about the actual cards. So I believe something else that changes with the editions is the style of the backs. So in this fifth edition, you have this sort of um, feline type character. Uh, and it's sort of in a negative style image, or I guess a regular silhouette style image. And then if it was reversed, you have this almost negative style image, like a photograph, right? Where it was like upright and reversed. So you can obviously, if, if you shuffle reversals in, see those reversals in the cards. Um, I don't typically work with reversals with this deck. I don't think I ever have. It is gilded, and my fifth edition is gilded in that sort of glittery gilding, and when I first got it, it shed a bunch, <laughs> um, but after working with it, the shedding stopped, and it's actually really pretty once it's worn a bit. Um, so yeah, I was not a fan of this gilding when I first got it, but it's held up surprisingly well, which I was not expecting, but there you have it. So let's get zoomed in. We're going to go card by card. Let me just pull out the majors only so that my stack isn't too high. And we're just going to talk about imagery until I don't have anything else to say. So we might be here for a bit. Maybe grab a snack, a beverage. Hopefully the lighting is bright enough. I may have to turn it up. I'm going to zoom us in and we'll see what the light looks like once we're zoomed in. I'm not going to zoom us in all the way so that you have room to expand your screen a bit. And let's see if I can turn the light. I think it's going to be okay, but I'm going to have the light up a bit. Hopefully there'll be no glare. Okay, so here we are at the Fool. So traditionally in the Fool, I love to see this sort of um, cliff or precipice happening. Uh, what I think is really interesting about this particular Fool is that there's still the creature here who's sort of tugging on him. And you can, whether you, whatever your reading style is or whatever your tradition is, you might view this um, animal companion as somebody who's helping or warning or somebody who's actually kind of getting in the way. In the background, you get all of these stars that are coming down that give you this idea of expanse and opportunity and possibility. But also beneath that, the mountains that are underneath this character who's just on this cliffside, like walking toward the cliff, these mountains look really sharp and kind of jagged. And as well, we have this idea of these like tendrils that are hanging down. And it's just kind of like, this looks really high up, but also really treacherous, right? So you definitely get that feeling of risk and of possibly being about to maybe go into some real scary territory also. So I feel like you get both the possibility and expanse with the sky and the risk with the mountains below. There's so much happening in all of these cards. So um, forgive me as I kind of go through this, but here we have our magician who has multiple arms and legs, which I think is really interesting. Um, we have almost, oh, is it eight? Let's see, we have two pairs of arms, so that's four, and two pairs of legs, yeah. So this particular magician has his appendages making physical contact with each of the four elemental tools. So he's holding a, a rod here and a sword above his head. He's got his hands clasped in prayer position right at his heart center. He's in this tree pose, so you get the feeling that he's very, like, composed and balanced and, and um, uh, poised. And then he's got one foot uh, in each of these, on each of these other tools, one foot in the cup and one on the pentacle, kind of holding on with his toes, which is really interesting. Um, above, we still have the lemniscate, which, we, which is this like permanent figure eight kind of feeling. And the lemniscate looks to be like a dragon that actually has wings coming out each side here. And it looks like there's a head on this side of the dragon and a head on that side of the dragon. So it's really interesting when you look at the symbol more up close. There are fruit bearing trees. So it looks like there's apple trees, what look to be orange trees and some kind of flowering tree up above. And I think those are the main things I noticed. It's interesting to me because it's almost like he's in a world all of his own and there's just all of this stuff happening. He's the central figure and you definitely feel yourself like looking at him, but and he does have all the tools he needs, but there's also an element of, of sort of wonder and like, oh, I wonder what he's up to. I don't know. There's just, there's a lot happening there. 
Man, I don't know. This is so good. Okay, so in our High Priestess card, we still have our High Priestess positioned in front of a veil, which is blocking um, the moon. And you get this feeling of, um, looks like cyclical orbits happening around the moon. I don't see water behind her, but there's this feeling that there's a scene behind her. You still have this very reddish curtain and these symbols on the actual curtain, I can't tell. I'm going to actually pick this up for a second and bring it really close to my face. Yeah, I don't think those are pomegranates. It almost looks like a floral pattern here happening. Um, what I think is especially interesting is we have these sort of almost two sides of the of the priestess here. We have one side, which if we just... Let's do it with this. It'll be less distracting, I think. If we just look at this side of the high priestess, right? We get this almost like... Um, Eve like energy, almost like somebody who's like wrapped in leaves and plants. She has a butterfly in her hand, um, mystery. And then on this side, I get almost like a, um, um, gosh, who am I thinking of? I'm s Lilith. Oh my gosh. I was, that was killing me. I almost get like a Lilith vibe on this side of the card. So you get this duality pictured here of almost like a, a more, um, potent energy on one side and a slightly more nurturing or sensual energy on the other side, which gives you a lot to play with as a reader because you could definitely look into either of these or look at the balance of the two. We still have the dark and the light pillar. And I do think it's interesting that there's the faces of the moon on, uh, decorated on each of these pillars up near the top. I just really like that. But I love that we have the sort of snake, the transform the transformative power of the snake here and the transformative power of nature here. Um, you definitely get this feeling like you're meeting a force of, um, of power here on her seat of power. And you definitely get the feeling like she has access to divine mysteries, which I think is really cool. And again, just lots of high priestess, awesome vibes here. Here on our Empress, I freaking love that our Empress kind of has antlers. And one thing you'll, you'll notice about the Ellis deck as we go through, if you haven't seen it before, is that the Ellis deck has this very fantasy world, like it's definitely its own universe with its own species kind of thing. This is not a, a perfectly human deck by any stretch of the imagination. But I love that she's very in her power. She's standing. She's wearing what looks to be some, uh, I don't know what these things are called. I'm really bad at that. But she's got armbands that look to be made of metal or bronze on her. She's holding the shield with the shafts of wheat right on it and the Venus symbol on it, which I think is awesome. She has a staff of power and she's looking at you head on. She feels a lot more fierce than a lot of our Rider Waite Smith um, style empresses often feel. They often feel like they're reclining. They often look pregnant. She does not. And I think it's really interesting that she seems a lot more powerful than other depictions of the Empress that we usually see. And I love that about her. It's like she's open and she's soft and she can be that mother figure, but she feels more like a fierce mother figure. And to me, this, um, she's still got, I believe the 12 stars. Yeah, there's six stars on each of the antlers. Um, and if you don't know, I believe, and please somebody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the 12 stars are for each of the 12 uh, signs in the Zodiac. Uh, and so she's got those there. She has a third eye uh, emblem or stone. And but I, again, I like this like idea that she's got these antlers because it, it takes us away from the maybe gender stereotypes in a way of the of the tarot. Maybe not all of you will agree, but I kind of feel like we often see this the, the stag horns being representative of the divine masculine in tarot. And I feel like she's got a bit of that energy in her. There's more of a a balance to her energy. She doesn't feel strictly stereotypically feminine, if that makes sense. And yet she's full of feminine power. It just depends, I guess, on how you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, she's standing in front of this forest. We get this feeling of her being in nature. She's all wrapped up in these vines. Um, and there seems to be like, this is just like a flower right um, at her sacral chakra area, um, which I just noticed. It could just be a hint at her sensuality because I believe that that's something that she possesses as well. When we move on to the emperor, we still have a very strong, bold emperor figure here. He's still got his staff. He still has his sphere. 
and he's seated fully armored and cloaked in purple. So we're definitely seeing shifts from obviously traditional coloration throughout this entire deck. I love the really big, like um, almost imposing rams. And I also like this perspective that it feels like we're sort of like looking up at him, like we're below him, like he's elevated somehow. And all of these mountains around him, he seems like he's as big as the mountains. And actually, if you look at a Rider Waite Smith Emperor card, you'll notice that the mountains also seem like he seems oversized. The Emperor feels like he's a giant in his landscape. And I think that's captured really in a really cool way here. I also think it's interesting that there's these two open flowers and there's this one bud right here in the center that hasn't opened yet. You almost get this feeling of like, I don't know, like this is his domain and like he's going to make sure that all of his creatures are cared for um, and he'll do what needs to be done. But he feels very strong, um, fairly imposing and fairly closed off, especially with this helmet up here. But I just really like the perspective in this card. I freaking love this Hierophant. Okay, so this Hierophant reminds me of um, the old... I forget the character name. Some of you is going to shout at the screen, but the old um, monkey character from The Lion King. And he also makes me think of uh, like Yoda a little bit and like just, I don't know, there's something about him. What I love about this Hierophant, he still has this staff in the same shape as we're used to seeing in the more Pope-like Hierophants, except he's not Pope-like. He seems like he's in a meditative pose, like a double lotus here. And he's holding up the, he's got the same hand position happening. He's still got the crossed key. So he's still barring that gateway, but he's sitting on stacks of books. And it's such an obvious example of like, he's got all of this knowledge and wisdom. He's got a very guru kind of feel to him, but somebody who you know is learned and is not just like talking out his butt. You know what I mean? Or at least that's the assumption. And you could also take this card and go, well, just because he's sit sitting on this, these books doesn't mean he's actually read them. And you could definitely look at the shadow side of the Hierophant with this energy. But I love that he looks like he's coming at, at you with a real wise energy. The lover's card. I really enjoy um, this image. It's again, very Garden of Eden, but it goes its own way. We feel like we're, they're literally on their own little island here. Again, more Rider Waite Smith, obviously than Marseille with this style of lovers. But I like that you can see again, this like difference in the cards. We have on this side, we have this very like moonlit night energy. And on this side where the, where the female or feminine looking character is, we have this sun energy. They've both got access to the same, what looks to be the same fruit and the same tree. And there's roots going from each side to the other side. You get this feeling of yin yang in this card. It looks like his helmet and his wings or his hair or his headpiece or whatever and his wings are all very fiery and she looks made of water. So you get the feeling of like, we would normally picture this solar character on the solar side and the lunar character on the lunar side, but they're in reverse. You get that yin yang feeling, right? A little bit of light and dark, a little bit of dark and light. And if you look, the waters that go around them are forming a heart, which is really cool. The chariot card. So here we have what looks to be the movement of the planets behind this very forward moving character who has the sun right at the um, front or the, the, the front of their chariot, physical chariot here. We have the dark and the light creatures in the front, but there's something about this like charging forward right at you with the stars and the cosmos behind them as if they have all of this, um, all of this power of the universe supporting them and what they're trying to accomplish. You also see that this character themselves is also made up of dark and light. So they're not just wrestling with making sure that their two creatures that are pulling them forward are aligned in both darkness and light, but they also have a combination of darkness and light. We have the dark arm here and the light arm, and they're holding a sword right in front of their soul, uh, excuse me, of their heart chakra slash throat chakra area. I just, I look for those things because it's interesting and it can give you something to chew on if you are familiar with the chakras or work with the chakras. I'm just waving my chopsticks stick around here, but I do think it's interesting. Um, I just, I really like the symmetry in a lot of these cards, and this is no exception. The strength card. Okay, this lion looks like it's smiling, which always makes me happy. This is a very wild card in a few different ways. We have the creature here who's sitting with and befriending or has befriended this lion. What's interesting to me is it's like the lion is a companion, like their inner strength, their inner ferocity, but they're also battling or seem to have control of the snake here, which to me speaks more to the 
more insidious or dark sides of their personal shadow. The fact that they're clothed in this very wild outfit with like a animal creature type um, hat and like fur boots and clothes, it just makes them look like they are part of this wild world and they're in harmony with it, but they're not afraid to take on the tough stuff. This is one of my favorite hermit cards probably ever. When you look really closely, the Hermit's Lantern is actually made up of all four suits. It's kind of hard to see, but the cup forms the base of his lantern. The sword goes up this side. There's a tiny little pentacle at the top, and there's a rod on the other side. And so you have all four elements, as well as the four elemental colors, making up this lantern. And here our, hier our, excuse me, our Hermit, not our Hierophant, is out in what looks like a snowy landscape, and he's sitting on the back of a slow moving turtle and you definitely get this feeling of solitary journey but also almost like he's taken the tools and the knowledge that he's gained through the other cards um he's got all the tools of the magician but he doesn't have to be flashy about it they're still there but they're much more integrated into his knowledge into his wisdom and he's carrying that light with him and shining it for others leading the way you can get the feeling that he almost might have um people who will later follow in his footsteps. I just think it's really, it's really powerful. The wheel card. Again, we have the four elements represented with these elemental colors. We have a really cool wheel here where if you look closely, there's a creature, two creatures that look like they are um, each kind of like a snake kind of creature and each one is eating the other one's tail. If you look really closely, this is so cool. The eye of this creature is the dark half of a yin-yang symbol, and the eye of this creature is the light half of a yin-yang symbol, which is super cool. Um, we have this like um, atom symbol at the center of the wheel, and then we have four symbols here, and I'm not familiar with these, so I'm not going to be able to help there. Um, I It stuns me that there's not a thick guidebook for this deck, or at least that I haven't encountered it. If you know about whether or not there is a more... Uh, detailed book. I'd be curious, but these are just pieces that I've picked up on looking at the cards. This particular wheel appears to have the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter represented because we have fruit here. We have this very spring-like look here, a very winter-like look up here. Um, and then the very outer ring looks like clouds, and then outside of that is stars. And this to me is a really accurate, and it's all got spokes as well, which is really cool. So this to me is very much like an, a representation of the Wheel of Life, and you get the feeling that everything is made up of wheels. No matter which part of the wheel you're looking at and which part you, you might be sitting on, you'll, you'll be having a slightly different experience, but everything exists on this wheel. It's very cool. I'm going to say very cool a lot because this deck is very smart. <laughs> Uh, so here we have our justice card. I love all the black and white here and the way that it's portrayed. We have the handle of the sword here is actually looks like the body of an eagle is the shape, which is really interesting. And it's white and being held upright. Whereas up here we have like a black body of an eagle. It might even be meant to be a crow or a raven. I'm not sure. And then hanging from that, these scales are in equal balance. Again, we have the light half of a yin yang in one half of the scales and a black half of the yin yang in the other side. Her crown is half and half. Her eyes are closed. You can tell this is a very neutral card. Lacking in other colors tells me it's lacking in emotion. It's a very clear action consequence. All things must be in balance kind of card. 23 minutes in, y'all. We're not even through the major arcana. I wasn't kidding when I said this was going to be a deep dive. <laughs> all right, so here's our hanged man. These are all little eyes in the fruits hanging from the trees. And these fruits are kind of the shape of pomegranates, which I think is interesting. I don't know if they're meant to be pomegranates, but it did, it did, was something that I noticed. Here we have almost like a rabbit-like creature hanging, and it looks like there is a snake coiling its way along this person or this creature. Um, and the head of the snake is very near the creature's like head, honestly. Like the, the head of the snake is right there. And the, this bunny type, I can't help but see it as a bunny because the ears, but this bunny type creature is holding their hands, cupping their hands around what looks like a central eye right in front of their heart space. It's, just, it's really interesting. We still have the halo of light surrounding their heads. You get the feeling like they're definitely coming to some awareness, but there's also a couple of coins on the ground as if there has been a sacrifice. There have been things they've had to give up and it hasn't necessarily been a comfortable place to hang out. Like they're not super relaxed here. There's a snake climbing on them, right? Like it's not, it doesn't look like a 
a relaxed scene and yet they seem very centered, very focused and aware of what they need to do in this space. Oh my gosh, the death card. Looks like it literally exists in the underworld, which I think is super cool. Um, we've got this throne of what looks like dead branches with thorns all over it and these dead trees, dead looking trees, imposing trees in the background. We have the central figure of death here seated on his throne holding an hourglass that the top half is empty and the bottom half is full as if there is a time at which all these things need, to, you know, everything comes to an end. There is a time for death, right? There is a time to let go. There is this tiny little bud of life. The only sign of life on the card, I would I would argue, every, the grass looks dead, everything looks dead, but there's this one little bud symbolizing an opportunity for new growth. But it's tender and it's small and it's vulnerable. It's not, you know, it hasn't grown yet, but there is something to nurture and something to feed. I'm a big fan of the yin yang so when I point those out and when I notice them just just know that that's that's a thing um I love that this is made out of water and fire and that this two-headed creature both masculine and feminine in balance are holding this together she's pouring out of her cup the water and he's pouring out of his cup the fire now this particular symbol is of special significance to me if you don't know um the yin yang is a, a very important symbol and personal symbol to me it symbolizes my marriage with peggy and we used actually this fire and water yin yang as a symbol of our relationship from the pretty much the very beginning she's very fire and i felt very water and you know, it, it, it's a whole thing, but we actually each have a tattoo on our body um, th that are slightly different. They're not matching tattoos, but they're both the same theme. And that is we each have a fire and water yin yang tattoo. She has one on her left or on her right shoulder and I have one on my left ankle. And I just freaking love this image <laughs> very much for that reason. Um, and in general, I love it when, when temperance shows a fire water balance because that's one of the things I see in this card. Um, but water tempers fire and fire tempers water. Where fire hits water, it evaporates, becomes steam. Where water hits fire, it puts it out and becomes smoke, right? There's this feeling of you can temper the intensity of either element with the other element or douse it entirely if it's out of balance. And so it gives you a lot of great stuff to chew on as a reader to look at that imagery and think about what that means in context with the question. I literally talk with my hands so much that having a prop is probably really bad. <laughs> I apologize if that's distracting. All right. The devil. Okay. What I think is super interesting about this, there's so many interesting things about this whole deck, but here we have two little um, creatures that look like they're kind of goat-like or have been turned into maybe little goats. It's hard to tell. What's super interesting to me, each one is chained up by this very loose fitting uh, collar, but the collar, if you look closely, are these are crowns. They are like crown, like royal crowns. And you get this feeling of almost like they got too much power or they got um, addicted to the power or they got wrapped up in the power of whatever this is that they're, they are bound to, right? It's interesting to me that the devil creature here doesn't seem to have a gender, which I love, and is pouring out this red like with this wine and they're both just lapping it up. That That's such a great metaphor for uh, so many things in life. Um that the devil could represent. It's also interesting that to one of these creatures, he is bound to a rod and to the other one of these creatures, he's bound to a sword. And you can kind of take that and run with that as a reader. If you want to, you could say like the sword representing getting caught up in, um, power struggles involving the mind. The other one more about passions. You could look at that and actually read with that, which I love. It's, there's something happening up here. It's, I don't know what this is supposed to be, but the devil is like, he's got one hand holding the goblet, one hand holding the sword, one hand holding the rod. And then this hand or appendage, I guess, is holding on to something that's on his head. And I just can't tell what it is. It looks like another hand. I think it might just be, oh, it's just its hand. It's, oh, it's coin. It's holding with its first finger and its thumb. It's holding on to this pentacle right here. So here again, interestingly, I just realized as I'm talking through it, that our devil is holding all four tools, just like the hermit is, just like the magician is. And yet each of them are doing such different things with that power, right? Isn't that interesting? So he's keeping creatures in bondage with that power. The hermit is leading with that power. And the magician is like, kind of overconfident in a way with that power. It's just really interesting because you could follow that line of thinking forward. 
it's just interesting to me to think about that power, that, that comparison, right? Like if we think about it, we have our magician with all the tools and we have the hermit with all the tools and we have the devil with all the tools, all holding and wielding and using them so differently. Super interesting. I got my cards out of order, but I don't think that's going to matter. Okay. Moving along the tower, big waves. The moon is down here below it, the sun or a bolt of light from the sun has struck the tower and struck it in half. Some people are going to love this because some people really want to see that the tower is its foundation is still solid. Except, you know what I just realized? This is tower is actually being hit from both directions at the same time. If you look, this wave has crashed up and there's a deep crack and little falling pieces. So the wave has come up from below. It's almost like this, this, um, the subconscious or the lunar energy or the feminine energy has come up from below and is knocking the foundation away as the sun, the clarity, that more active energy is coming from above and knocking the top half of the tower up or off. So again, we have that balance of forces, the balance of nature, both the subconscious or the, 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 what the water represents for you, as well as the sun and the fire. Oh, so good. Decks like this get me excited because there's so many things that you can tell the creator thought through when doing this artwork. Here we have the star, and every time I look at this card, it feels almost overly sim simple compared to the rest of the cards. It's it's harder to pinpoint. It doesn't look as tangible as the other cards, and I'm sure that that is intentional. But all I can focus on is this bright light that's shining from the central point here. And my eyes have a hard time kind of, I guess, distinguishing what everything else really is. It looks like it might have been a flower that opened up or something. Um, it's almost as if the skies parted and this light came through. But beyond that, I haven't gotten a lot of extra like things jumping out at me. I'd be curious if you're watching this, what you see in this image, because I've definitely struggled to see more tangible shapes and objects. It's just like my eye goes right to the light, which I think is what's me meant to happen. But I feel like I might be missing something. So I'd be curious if you see anything I don't, but I love that, that bright light. Shockingly, one of my least favorite star cards in this deck, just because maybe because I just don't understand the image like I do the others. Food for thought. <laughs> the moon. Oh, I love this one. Okay. I'm going to just, uh, I wish I had like a solid, I should have brought a solid card, but for now I'm just going to use this because it's the most solid thing. So a, a, a huge favorite in this moon card. So on one half, we have this lovely scene. We have a peaceful face reflected in the water. The moon is full and we have all this fruit on the trees. There's a wolf ha uh, howling in the background, excuse me, a dog howling in the background. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely scene. And then when you look, when you flip to the other side, it's literally completely different. We have a much more like um, dark uh, face in the water. These are all thorny vines and instead of a tree with fruit it's like reaching hand with blood red fingernails um, and of course the wolf on this side so you have the wild and the tame and they are literally divided in half on the card itself which is really cool but beyond the wild and the tame aspect which you can definitely go into there's also this element of like not seeing everything like which are which is the truth is it the tree with the fruit is it the reaching hand and it speaks to how your fears can skew what you're seeing which is really interesting for the moon card here we have the gorgeous sun and this is some uh, a character who looks to be dressed in an eagle or hawk outfit here looking up at the sun which to me has the face of a lion it's it's really beautiful to me and it's it makes me think of the it makes me think of again aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. I might have talked about this before with my associations, but um, this feeling of being exposed, of sort of looking up and having this light kind of expose you in a way and force you to face your true nature, that may be a little deep for the sun. Sometimes the sun is just about joy and light and um, uh, letting your hair down in a way and having things illuminated. But there's also, to me, an aspect of really uh, casting off the masks that we wear I suppose being authentic and it's interesting to me that this person is sort of in this costume almost and then facing the sun as if they're just beginning that process of casting away the roles that they fill. Here we have the judgment card um, and we have this central figure that looks to be some kind of bird-like figure up at the very top here with the horn and 
if we look, it's almost as if they're weighing these two sort of, they're using these two sort of um, means for judge for judgment, right? On this side, we have what looks to be like a demonish, a demonish type creature. And on this side, it almost looks like the silhouette of like a Buddha. And you get this feeling of like dichotomy between good and not, and evil, right? And then as you look below, you see here's just a skeleton, right? So somebody who's passed and there's this beam of light coming from this cloud. And then in the cloud, this person seems tapped in and their heart is lit up in the center and it's as if their heart is being judged. Um, especially up here where you see this character has like a flame heart over here, a flame surrounding a pure heart over here. So it's like a shadow heart that gets enveloped by flame and a, a pure heart that is protected from this flame. It's just really interesting. It's a whole scene of being, um, of truly being judged. And you know, I don't often see the judgment in this way, so it's really interesting. It's also interesting to me that the E, that right at the center of the word judgment, is highlighted. Um, man, I wish there was a big guidebook for this deck, but it's still really cool to me. It definitely highlights that idea of, like, how do you want to be judged at the end of this life? That is a very Christian concept, true, but I'm sure that there are other ways to look at this in that sense, right? When How do we want to live our life? Do we want to have lived it with a pure heart or, you know be faced with decisions that we regret at the time of our passing, which it's a big question. And often I don't ask those when I'm doing just a standard reading, but it is interesting that it's depicted that way. I love this world card. I'm such a geek for all of the elements being represented and I love this here. So here the figure themselves is made up of all of the elements. They have fire here, they have earth here, they have water over here, and they have air, almost looking like cyclones over here and this pure white at the center. And they're holding these two big rods behind them and the figure eight that they're contained kind of within is behind them in this big like symbol here. It's cool, I love it. All right, that is the majors, whew, that was a lot. That was almost 40 minutes of majors. Now let's dive into the minors. So we're gonna go one suit at a time. We're gonna start with the rods, which is the suit of fire and matches up with the suit of wands. Here we have the ace, deep roots and big rod here. It looks like it's on fire, like a torch, like a big flaming torch, but it's grounded in the earth. You get the feeling like there's this like very uh, strong idea to grasp hold of. It's not just fleeting, right? It's gonna, it's, it's something that can blossom into more. Here we have our figure sort of holding this one little globe and looking out very Rider Waite Smith here. It's interesting because it looks like she's kind of holding on to one of the leaves from these plants. I don't know, maybe that's not what I'm seeing. No, she's just holding the staff. Um, and these staffs aren't actually blooming like we see here in the ace, right? Blooming with fire. The fire is contained and she's looking out at like, what, what are the possibilities? Like what could be next? In the three, our character is met by this large wolfy like companion. And you can look at the plants here and they've started to open a little bit. So things have begun. They've begun to sort of um, uh, blossom just a tiny bit. They're opening there. You can see that uh, movement starting. And we do see a real journey in this world with the with these people. Here we have a pause, like a break from that forward momentum. And here we have a fox. These are like fox. It's the same kind of creature that we see here. Um, but here it has split tails, two tails. And there's like a, looks like an elder and a youth in the background. Um, but this one here is just sheltered. And I like the four of wands as a moment of like recognizing that now that you've, you've done that forward push and now there's time for things to stabilize and really like um, be able to withhold or withstand some elements, right? It's got structure and stability now. In the five, we see this conflict happening. Um, all these different creatures, all with their wands. The wands themselves look like they're, or the rods themselves in this deck, they look like they're all closed up. Um, and everybody is in a slightly different position, is dressed totally differently. So you get this idea of different perspectives kind of clashing. Here in the six, we have the victory. I really like that the character is walking beside their um, animal companion that still has the two tails. Most of these wands or rods are closed up, but the central one that our main figure is holding has um, elongated, it's opening, it's elongating, and there's this wreath here. Very success, victory, celebration, um, but it's very like uh, honor. It feels like honor in that card. 
This is such a freaking fierce seven of rods and I love it so much. So here we can see that the wolfy companion looks like it now has four tails and um, somebody more familiar with the mythology might be able to speak in speak on this but there is a creature in some mythology and I'm not going to try to pretend to know um, that uh, ultimately has nine tails and I, I don't know enough to speak to it but I know that throughout this suit you see that the animal companion um, develops more and more tails which to me the way that I interpret that is like um, building wisdom as we go like something is is growing and developing that's how I view it but that's just my layman perspective what I really like here is the body language the wide stance the forward-looking gaze from both the animal companion and the primary creature of the card here, the way that all of these rods are pointed as if they're like attacking and this hand movement in front that is like, stop. This also looks like the hand is in a mudra. I don't know the mudra. <laughs> Bad yoga, yoga teacher. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that mudra is. If you know, I'd be curious. It looks like that might be what it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe it, it it's just coincidence, but He's got the thumb holding the um, first finger down. So these three fingers are up and then these two are touching. Um, and I feel like I know that that means something. I just, I don't know what. Um, but what really catches my attention is just that forward movement, that hand like stop, like stay back um, energy. It's very protective, defensive um, and very strong and courageous. Love this. The eight of rods, they're all shooting down. And all of the rods actually have these like fox-like creature faces on them. I don't even know if they're really foxes. I don't know what the right word is, but um, I just love that. There we go. So here we have the nine of rods and now the creature does have nine rods and is standing in front of its caregiver here. There's one rod, the last rod that this character is holding is fully in flames. And these other rods look like they've been burnt out. So it's like he's on his last legs here and his, his animal companion has almost stepped to the forefront as if he's helping to guard and protect him. And here we have the 10 rods, all of which have been uprooted and are strapped to our character's back. We get the feeling of age here, right? He's like walking with a cane type um, rod here to the left and the animal companion, just one tail and very gray and kind of heading for this big, big hill. And you almost get the feeling like, okay, this particular task, this particular project is has reached its natural conclusion. Like we're, we're at that end point now. We just need to make it to where we can put it to bed. Um, very emotive when you really sit with the imagery. Our court cards. We have our young page, closed rod, um, both face on, full of life and eagerness and animal companion with them. Here we have our bold knight. We see big floofy tails, at least two of the animal companion. And the animal companion's huge. He's like a little bit smaller. Full flaming rod. Our queen, very close up. Open sunflower, something we're used to seeing in the Rider Waite Smith. Not afraid to look you right in the face. Um, very bold, but lots of florals here, which really speak to that sensuality. And our king of rods, very champion. Lots of these look like um, uh, oak leaves in the fall creating part of his armor here. These are very, it's interesting because this suit is a suit of fire and yet it's very earthy at the same time and very natural. He's got his um, animal companion up here behind him. He doesn't need to guard the figure. The figure is central prominence up front and in forward, in, up front and in forward. That's what I was saying, but hopefully you followed that. Um, so that is the suit of rods. Let's take a look next at the suit of cups where we meet our sort of mer people. So central here, we have our ace surrounded by water, nice big cup, lots of light pouring in. That works for me. I really prefer actually to see my cups like with water actually overflowing, but you have these like little wave symbols right on the cup itself. So it definitely is a full cup. We have our two figures in the two of cups. They are each holding their own cup. They're meeting each other um, in that space. You can tell they're in a world almost all their own. The sun is shining in the space right between them. Something else that's really neat about this deck I think is interesting is that we definitely get kind of, she's got like pinker, fuller lips. You could get this male, female energy here if that was your practice, but you might also be able to see a lot more mixed gender stuff because these are really non-human creatures, which I think is cool. I don't know if it's perfect in that way. I don't think any deck really can get it perfect, but it's nice that it's there and you can kind of play with it a bit. Our three of cups, very feminine energy here for sure. Uh, but all three creatures a little bit different, holding up their cups in celebration. Again, very Rider Waite Smith, which is fine with me. Our Four of Cups. Interesting here that she's looking forward. She's got these three cups stacked up, 
and she's got her head resting in her, I was gonna say hand, but it's more like a hand fin. But behind her, it's almost like this like tentacle is offering, something from the sea is offering her this gift, this extra cup. And again, I think you can play with the meanings, but that's what I see. Here's our five, our creature mourning, the three cups that have spilled and are in the sea, but there's two still behind her on the rock. These are so cute. These little creatures are so cute. <laughs> These like little tiny baby mer creatures <laughs> looking at each other on their stack of cups. I just love it. Very reminiscent of like when times were simpler and the pleasures of our youth. The seven of cups. I love this because at first glance it's almost pippish, but then you look a little closer and you're like, oh, interesting because there's a skull engraved into this cup. Stacks of hearts here. What looks like a strawberry here, a harp here, a lotus here, um, a crab or maybe even a spider here and a big sun. So you still have a lot of that symbology of things trying to decide like which cup to take, which to focus on. Each is so different, offers its own consequences and rewards. The eight of cups. All eight, oh my gosh, sorry, my, when my cards get like messy, it bugs me. All eight stacked up um, in the shadows. She's dove back into the sea where it's all lit with sunlight. It almost looks like it's golden. Like she's left this behind and she's gone back to the sea or gone into the sea. And this is such a genie card, which is so cute. He just has that genie look about him, super happy, all these little cups. And I actually don't think... I've ever noticed before that they are full. Each little cup has a cute little, what looks like um seahorse type creature in it. And so this creature is like underwater and you just, it's just, it's so cute. And then our 10 of cups, which I love this because to me, again, we see a hint of a yin yang right here at the center. The rainbow goes all the way around and you get this feeling of contentment and happiness and peace all within oneself our page of cups with the little seahorse poking out of the cup. I love that. Our knight of cups riding the seahorse. Love that. Our queen of cups holding the big bowl, the big bowl like cup, I should say. And our king. I love that the king has all these like little seahorses and a little young one in his arms. He's got that more nurturing, more approachable vibe. He's broader shouldered. He's got a big smile. He seems approachable, which I like in my king of cups. Next up, we have swords. One of my favorite pages of swords ever is in this deck, but we'll get there. Okay, so our Ace of Swords um, has this, and you can tell really truly by the color tones, if you haven't noticed yet. So this is the color tones. It's very consistent of the rods, all those browns and greens and yellows. And then through the cups, we have all of these blues and golds. And then when we get into the swords, we have these pinks, rosy colors, and purples, and blacks. And so it's very easy when you lay these cards out in a spread to see the elemental configurations. And each suit seems to have its own, like, little world, like the mer people or the people with their fox companions. Um, and now we have the raven people. So we have our ace of swords. Very sword in the stone kind of vibe here with the sword plunged into this very rocky looking material. It's interesting because if you look, this... This background to me almost looks like an ethereal figure, like reaching for the sword. That could be my imagination, but I feel like I see it. <clears throat> In this Two of Swords, it's actually ravens that are blocking the eyes of our central figure as if they are her spirit guides or their spirit guides. And the two swords crossed in front of the heart. Very Rider Waite Smith, Three of Swords. Always kind of mildly disappointed when this is what we see because it's so been so done. Um, but I do like that there's like a raven sword, a raven sword, and then a central sword. And the raven swords each have like what looks like blood on them, but the central sword doesn't. And it, it gives you something at least to look at and work with as a reader. The four of swords, that feeling of rest, one sword beneath, and then the three swords above. Hands in prayer pose. The five of swords, um, all the swords of the battlefield, they're covered in what looks like either rust or blood. And this, uh, bird-like creature, raven-like creature has two swords, but the head is downturned and you get these two figures, shadowed figures looking away in the back. You definitely get this feeling of like not feeling great about this win necessarily, right? The six of swords with this really cool, like sort of airship over water. Um, love this because this is like these people or these figures in this deck are obviously in tune with the crows. So they're flying with the crows almost. You get this feeling of like 
going with their flock to move away from whatever it is they need to move away from. <clears throat> Here in the Seven of Swords, I almost get this feeling like this is a character that's on this ship. Like, even though it doesn't quite match up, I kind of get that feeling that he's up high and he's on that ship and he's like taking off with the swords. But these two creatures have seen, these two crows have seen him and are kind of calling him out. He's got this rope, he's about to escape, but like, he's not going to get away scot-free. This is such a bound up, very, very stuck eight. And I usually like to see how there's a very clear way out. Um, and I don't really see that here. I'd be curious if those of you watching can see a clear way out for this character. But the ravens are bound. She's very bound. All the swords, there's like little spiders on the swords that look like black widows, like on the handle. So she looks actually properly stuck. Um... It's harder for me to work with an image like this and say like, oh yeah, it's really easy to get yourself out. It's like, no, it's not. But how much of that is her getting in her own head and how much of it is actual reality is where I would go with it probably as a reader. But it's, it's tough. Like this is a really intense image for me. And then our nine of swords. Interesting how it almost looks like an extension of her that's up in here that is creating all of this um, fear and drama and anxiety. You definitely get the feeling like it's coming from her um, or from this character. There's a lot of unhappiness. There's bags under the eyes and then all of the swords here and this like creature. It's, it's very nightmarish. And a difficult ten of swords as well. So this is a very intense suit in this deck and I know that's not going to be for everybody um, because that's a lot. <laughs> but you definitely still have this one single pure like white kind of raven silhouette in the background or, or dove or whatever it is it's supposed to represent representing that hope and that things can go up from here so you can still hone in on that I love this page of swords because it looks like he it looks like a magnifying glass and it gives you this very detective -y vibe which is very much what I get from the page of swords as an energy so I love that the Knight of Swords on his three-headed crow getting ready to go do battle he looks like he is not messing around the Queen of Swords, she has like gone through all this stuff from this suit and has managed to like be extra fierce because of it. She has what looks like a Black Widow like looking spider that actually hangs out around her neck and she is sharpening, sharpening her nails on this sword. Um, and it looks like there's one single little red tear <laughs> streaking down her cheek. So there's that hint of like emotion but also ferocity and yeah, she's a badass. I love it. And then our King of Swords with one dark crow and one light crow. You get this feeling of like balance and of um, directness here. And finally, our pentacles. Our ace with the big pentacle, almost like a piece of fruit hanging from the tree. And here we have these like, I think there's like hair creatures the whole way through. I can't remember now. Or maybe not but here we have a creature who is or figure who's in this like hair mask and is juggling these two coins in the three we get somebody who's working by themselves and they've actually walled themselves off but they are like working on a like chiseling away at a statue which is super interesting it's kind of for me missing that second figure that would be that collaborative effort but you definitely get that work um feel from this card I like that the four here feels, it's very guarded and much less graspy, but you get to feel like they need to hold on to these resources because you get these pairs of eyes behind them, like something is there ready to take their resources from them. And you can, as a reader, read that as like, okay, they actually do need to hold on because something's, they're at risk here, or are they just being paranoid and holding on too tight? So you can really go either way. Our five with the stars offering guidance above and these figures just looking really despondent below the six it's interesting to me because you can tell that this person has lots of bounty and they're collecting their harvest and here's this person coming you get the feeling like are they gonna ask for help or are they just gonna try to take what they need like it's interesting it's a different scene than we're used to seeing where you see an active give and take happening um you can kind of play with that here we have the seven and just waiting for the right time for harvest. And there's this one singular ripe pentacle or coin here. And you can tell they're, they're perhaps just getting ready to harvest. You get the feeling of the elder teaching the youth about timing and patience here. 
I love that the Eight of Pentacles is a bridge and you see a figure just, just putting the last piece of the bridge into place. I love that. And the Nine are our figure here with all of the pentacles around their neck, neck piece, and some here on the tail feathers of this bird companion. Love that. Like very complete and also in the moment. Here we have the 10. All these creatures, you get this big kind of grouping or community of people in the back. We still have, it looks like that um, arrangement of the coins in the symbol or in the shape of the, the Kabbalah tree of life. Um, if you're really looking for it, but it's also like embedded in the scene. Like it's really more about this like established community that is thriving than anything, which I really love. Here's our page with this little like warthog like friend. I love this. Um, definitely going to get it done. Our cautious, careful, thorough knight of pentacles. Our giving queen of pentacles. And our very wise leader, king of pentacles. Oh, good cards. Oh my gosh, that was, that was a lot. But that was a lot of fun to go through. This is a really, really detailed deck and there's a lot to look at. I do find that some of the details are easy to miss if you don't really take your time with this deck. So don't be afraid when you do pull cards with this one to really sit with them for a bit and take in the imagery and sort of see what you notice because there's so much to unpack. If you do pick this up, whatever edition you have, I hope that you love it. I hope that it was fun to sort of get this like sort of like slow tour through the, the deck and I'd be curious to hear any of your thoughts on any of the imagery or anything you noticed as I was going through the cards because every time I work with this deck it's like I see something else so I would love to hear your take as well as always thank you so so much for watching this has been a lot of fun all the links that you need to support me support the channel are down below please don't forget to like this video do all of the good things and may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye guys.